So I think this is a signal that everybody quiet down. So uh, welcome, good afternoon everyone. It's a great pleasure to see you, uh, the full room. Uh, we have uh, a second speaker of this series of Mendel Lectures. It's actually 17th series already this year. So uh, it's really uh, a great that we have been able to uh, attract many world leaders in science, some of them having a Nobel uh, Lord Prize, or they have been really uh, outstanding in, in the field of not only basic research, but also how this basic research uh, uh, helps understand the mechanisms and clinical uh, relation in understanding the diseases. And, and today's speaker is not going to be any different, so it's for me actually a personal pleasure to introduce uh, uh, Andres Aguilera, uh, and before I'll ask him to present the lecture, I'll of course introduce him. Uh, he did his PhD in, in Seville, uh, in the field of biology, and then he moved on postdoc in University of Darmstadt, and then another postdoc at uh, New York University uh, with Hannah Klein. Uh, he has been working on, on yeast, using yeast as a, as a model, uh, using uh, genetics as a major tool, uh, Together with his, during his postdoc position, he has identified some of the key factors responsible for hyperrecombination phenotype. And one of these factors, H, uh, HPR1, is actually the gene which he has then uh, started to work on in his uh, own lab in 1991, uh, when he went back to Seville again, to Spain. And uh, then he was actually uh, joined the part of uh, uh, Kabimer, which is uh, Andalusian uh, Molecular Biology and Regenerative Medicine Center. And he's actually, since 2016, he's heading uh, the center. And throughout his career, uh, he has started uh, at the beginning looking at, at the role of uh, many of the factors regulating recombination, discovering uh, some of the, the factors involved in the transcription. And I think this is what, what uh, kept him really going through those years in 90s till now, where he played really instrumental role in, in, in linking the replication to genomic instability on its own and trying to understand the mechanism. So it was really a pioneering studies, uh, discovering the thought complex uh, responsible uh, for what the instabilities associated in, in transcription, replication, collision. It's actually the, uh, it was the key discovery that Andres did is actually the uh, the all uh, R-loop uh, theories and role of the R-loops, which now is becoming really a hot topic in, in many of the fields, uh, and, and linking some of the factors involved in, uh, uh, in uh, suppression of uh, breast cancer, tumor suppressor BRCA2 and fanconinemia, and actually preventing the R-loop formation, and many more and more studies that his lab has produced. And I would like to stop with actually three things which personally I think are are intriguing. So first is that, and I mentioned it, that he uses a yeast as a, as a model. I think this is what is now disappearing more and more, that the model organisms are not being appreciated as they, are, as they should be, because they are still essential in understanding some of the key basic uh, mechanistic understanding of, of metabolism, DNA, RNA, and, and so on. The second thing is, is also that he was able to be successful when he returned back to Spain. And, uh, and we all know how easy it is to recruit really uh, talented PhD students and postdocs. So despite not being in the hub of Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, and so on, he was really able to produce excellent science. So I hope that uh, we can also maybe follow these footsteps and even here in Czech Republic uh, form uh, uh, good centers or great labs. So without any ado, I would like to ask Andres if he can present his lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lumi, for the invitation, for the kind introduction. Um, certainly, uh, you are being already successful because I have been coming here to Brno since several years back. It has been now three or four that I didn't come. And I have been seeing how the, the city and the, and the laboratories and the science being produced here is really uh, making really a, a wonderful improvement. Therefore, I mean, I'm sure that you will do, <laughs> absolutely. And you are doing, it's not that you will do, you are doing, it's a reality. Okay, then, uh, uh, I will be talking about, this is one of the, uh, as Lumi said, one of the main part of our work in the lab, 
uh, not directly related with double strand brake repair that is system chromatic recombination repair that is the other topic that we we get in then i will try to give you a, a general picture of of, of of the point of, of which we are now on rna mediated genome instability starting with some historical uh, views and also conceptual thing that i want just to transmit to you then this is basically the way we focus the, the, the problem of genome instability. No? Basically, spontaneously, most of the damage generated in the DNA or, or the problems have to do with uh, replication. Then there are uh, many aspects in the, uh, of things happening in the DNA that will block the progression of the replication for. Usually, the cells ha uh, uh, have ways to deal with this. But if this is persistent mainly to the collapse of the foreign generate a break, this is put in here in a very simple manner. Uh, both the breaks and situations in which the, the fork is blocked are going to trigger the DNA damage response. And certainly, when you have the problem, there is still the way of, 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 of arranging, no? of fixing up this problem. But I, and if this is a double strand break, then you get double strand break repair. And then, of course, you can get also replication restart and all that. Then this is something occurring very often in the cell, but the cell has a way to deal with all these problems. But if this doesn't work, then you get the problem of genome instability. No? I mean, you can create situations in which the replication blocks occur at a much higher uh, frequency than usual, uh, or you can really affect the DNA damage response itself or double strand back repair. And by doing, by affecting all these points, you are going to increase the, the, the frequency of DNA breaks, and therefore that is what leads to genome instability. Therefore, the point I want to make that genome instability is a pathology, okay? It's not just normally occurring in the cell, and this is why it's very much related to cancer. Most tumoral cells suffer of genome instability, and this is because there are uh, deficiencies in, in, in the three basic DNA damage response, repair, itself that is part of the dynamic response or situation that leads to these blocks affecting replication stress. Then when the replication is moving, it may find during the uh, replication, when the replication for is moving, might, may find different uh, structures that are going to block the progression. The main one, different type of DNA damage, torsional stress, uh, secondary structure like hairpins or G quadruplexes, heterochromatin, uh, tightly bound, uh, DNA, uh, I mean, proteins bound to the DNA. And the one that we focus mainly is transcription, as Lumir already mentioned, transcription replication conflicts. And um, part of these are related to the formation of co-transcription and R loops. These are the parts that we are focusing mainly and I will be talking in during this talk. I just want to go back to this conceptual problem to all uh, publications. Already Bruce Albers in early 90s has this tried to, to respond this to this main question because the DNA is the same road through which both replication and the transcription machinery has to move on. And the question is when they coincide in one point how the situation is solved. They were working in phage and bacteria and therefore this is a very simple and in most cases in vitro thing. And the, the solution that they ended in the paper was that the RNA polymerase has a kind of two-step uh, ways of acting. Then as it's moving the replication for and hits the RNA polymerase, then there is a two-step model by which you first open this part and then the replication moves ahead. Now you open the second part and then replication can go smoothly. We know that now this is not like that settling in eukaryotes because there is not clear that RNA polymerase is able to do this and therefore the things is much more complex. But I want to bring this as, as a way that this is a, a problem that has been already in the field since many years ago. And we still don't know how this is solved, okay? Uh, and the other part I want to bring is this one. There are all papers, and I put just the seminal ones, one in bacteria and another one in G cells, but there are many others now coming after those in which you can see that there is a gene induction, I mean, gene induction in this case is activation of transcription, induce the rate of mutagenesis by using a particular genotoxic agent, okay? Then if you uh, try to make mutagenesis with this, if the gene is transcribed, you will get that the rate of mutagenesis is higher. And in this case, it's the same, it's similar, uh, this Sherlin Reader, this, this work, 
with showing the transcription by RNA polymerase one stimulate recombination, in this case, the RDNA recombination in Ferebisin. Then I just want to show you with some data that we produce in the lab later on, because we try to make the connection with replication, because uh, everything I showed you be up to now is not connected with replication in terms of why transcription induce uh, genetic instability measured by mutagenesis or by recombination. This is G cells, and here we analyze recombination frequency in a system that we can control transcription. And you can see that in here we are inducing transcription with 4NQO, okay? And, uh, sorry, we are inducing damage with 4NQO. If we transcription is off, okay, the increase is very little, it's twice, I mean, the frequency. But if we now activate transcription, you can see that the increase in the recombination frequency is much higher, it's a spectacularly increased. Therefore, transcription somehow is making the ability of this foreign QO to get better into the, the DNA. That is what we always thought. That is, you open the accessibility to damage. And probably that is one reason, but it's not everything. And you can see that in here. In here, we put a system, we design a system. This is GIST. We can do that, as Lumi said. This is the advantage of using GIST. We can uh, confront a transcription and replication machinery, okay? And then we activate transcription and see what happens in the frequency of recombination. This is with the transcription off. And then we keep the cells in G1 so that replication is not occurring. If we activate transcription, the increase is minor. But if we active, um, uh, and this is because we put in here a G1 promote. If we put an S promoter, I mean a promoter that is activated during S phase, you can see that there is a huge increase. Therefore, in order for transcription to increase the replication rate, you need to have replication going on. Oh, sorry, the, the recombination rate, you need replication to be going on. And this is where, how we got, uh, we get into this concept of the, of the conflicts. They, you all know this. This is just to, for those of you that are not familiar now with the actual uh, uh, picture of transcription. Transcription is very complex process because it occurs coordinated with different steps. We have pre-initiation, initiation, elongation, termination of transcription, but at the same time, there is RNA processing the assembly of the nascent RNA into a mRNP particle, a ribonucleoparticle, and many of these proteins are uh, cofactors or are RNA export factors that allow the export of the RNA, nascent RNA through the nuclear pore. And this is everything coordinated, and we have this uh, uh, coordination between and coupling, and let's say coupling between transcription itself and RNA export through the nuclear pore in eukaryotes. Now we are moving and we are focusing on eukaryotes. Therefore, this is an important part of the, of the formation of this assembly. Then, the aspect that we got into, as uh, Lumi said, was the R loop. What is the R loop? You all know this is a DNA RNA hybrid that has displayed the single stranded DNA. There are different ways of, of uh, detecting R loops. The most popular one is now using this antibody. This antibody also recognizes double stranded RNA. Therefore, when one uses it, has to remove the signal with uh, an RNA sage because RNA sage removes specifically the RNA strand of the hybrid. But you can use other ways by using an inactive RNA sage that binds to the DNA RNA hybrid and gets and stick there, uh, or an or, uh, an RNA H binding domain fused to a GFP, whatever. And there are indirect ways that are very very useful, like the bisulfide mutagenesis for example. Why? Because as you know, bisulfide works on single-stranded DNA. Then you can use the bisulfide to make in, in vivo, I mean, I mean, you isolate the DNA and you make now the mutagenesis, and now you can sequence. And then by sequencing, you can go molecule by molecule and you can uh, infer the length of the DNA RNA hybrid, okay? And this is the size. I want just to bring this into, into this, this concept because sometimes we don't realize. I mean, as you know, during transcription, there is a very short RNA-DNA hybrid inside the RNA polymerase. This is eight, nine, ten nucleotides. This is very small. This is not what we are talking when we talk about an R-loop. r is generated behind the RNA polymerase, and it can go from 50 base pair to 1100 base pair. I showed you some data that we produce in G cells, and you can see different single molecules analyzed. You can see that we go from 50 to almost 5, 400, in this case 500. These are different mutants 
Some of them, their loops lead to instability. In some others, they do not lead. In some cases, we have wild-type mutants, we have histone mutant. And the important thing is that you see that the average in this particular race is about 160 base pair. I think it's important just to keep that in mind. The type of structure that we are talking about is this size, but they can go really high. Um, but now, uh, as this has been moving on, we know that DNA RNA hybrids can be formed also in normal cells. You don't need to have a particular condition that increase their loop. And this has been worked out by many laboratories, and we can see their loops in retrotransposon, in RNA pol 2 genes, in rDNA, at the telomeres, at terra, RNA pol 3 genes, and even in the centromeres, we can see accumulation of our loop because they might be structural there, and they are associated with probably compaction of the, of the, of the centromere, and also in antisense RNA, you know, at the five prime and three prime of them. Therefore, you can, using uh, uh, what is DNA, RNA, immunoprecipitation, detects regions where normally our loops might be formed, okay? And therefore, they are there. The question is they don't need to necessarily produce a problem. Then, what is the, the, the bio biology of, of, of the DNA, RNA hybrids of their loop? Well, we know that they were in class switch recombination and immunoglobulin genes. The class switch recombination occurred between the S regions, and in order for that to occur, you need transcription, and this is associated to formation of DNA RNA hybrids. Mitochondrial DNA re replication initiates in a DNA RNA hybrid, long DNA RNA hybrid that is produced by RNA polymerase. Transcription regulation and termination, there are now new uh, evidence for that, especially from Nick Proufus' uh, lab. Uh, long non coding RNA mediated silencing might be related in some cases of a loop. Certainly, you know, CRISPR Cas9. CRISPR can nice use a guide of RNA and makes a DNA RNA hybrid to get into there. Therefore, the DNA RNA hybrid is a natural uh, thing occurring in the cell, and cells deal with that. And in some cases, they take advantage. But if you produce too many, the, the main problem is genome stability. Okay, there are many conditions in which you cannot control the levels of their loops, and because that, they, you get the problem of the genome instability. Therefore, uh, how do you get into the genome instability? Uh, there are two ways. In non-cycling cells, the single-stranded DNA is more susceptible of damage, okay? Uh, nucleases, genotoxins, uh, 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 ROS, they can act better on single-stranded DNA. Therefore, this is believed to have happened in G0, G1, certainly in S phase, but certainly that would be the main aspect. Now, there are uh, studies in which you can see the accumulation of our loops in neuronal cells, okay? And therefore, you would think in this way. But during the cycling cells, what the main problem maybe is because they are helping the RNA polymerase into this replication transcription collision, okay? This has been studied in Hedon and in co-directional. It's much stronger the problem in Hedon. Why? Probably because when we have a Hedon situation, the RNA polymerase is still there. When we have a co-directional, the MCMs, uh, uh, proteins, uh, that is the replicative helicases, might be able to remove the RNA. We don't know, but certainly, and we knew, th knew that before uh, putting into here the, their loops, we know that the collisions are more, uh, 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 pr more problematic when they are in head -on. Then I want to show you some genetic things. And this is, uh, this is the FAC complex. FAC complex is a chromatin reorganizing complex. Uh, it was discovered by in human cells by Danny Reinberg, and it was to, is, is known to be required for transcription uh, through nucleosome, or th through chromatin. And basically what he's doing is swapping the nucleosome ahead of the polymerase to behind. But since the very beginning, we knew that that had to do something with replication, because one of the subunits was part of the DNA polymerase tree. And, and it's known that the FAC complex is also required for replication. Therefore, it's a, multi, it's a complex that is not specifically involved in transcription. Then what we did some time ago is this. We analyzed replication spreads. This is in human cells. And for doing that, we do single molecule analysis. That is uh, the, what is the, called combing. We take the fibers of the chromosome, and by using two different uh, fluorochromes, we are able to see the DNA synthesis. In red is where they initiate replication. At the moment, we put the pools of the fluorochrome, and in green, we can see the, the track of the DNA region that is being replicated. Then we use that with particular times, and then we are able to uh, see the, the speed. And then you can see here, this is the speed of the replication for in a normal cell, 1.4 kb per minute. And when we remove by SIRNA 
the two components of the, of the FAC complex, you can see that there is a significant decrease of the speed from 1.4 to 0.9 kV. Okay? This is just normal cell. And this is accompanied by an increase in damage. This damage is seen by single cell electrophoresis, the comet assay. We just put the nuclei in, the, in an electrophoretic field, and if the DNA is broken, then they will migrate, and then you see that. But this is normal cells, okay? Problem in replication, damage. And now what we do is you, we inhibit transcription, and for that we use cordycepine that inhibit the incorporation of the adenine. And you see what happened. Now we don't see the problem in the replication fork speed, and now we don't see the damage. Then this is amazing. I mean, this is telling us that this is a complex that perhaps the main function during transcription and the main function during replication is to deal with the situation in which you have the conflicts. It's when we really see the problem, no? Because we now, it looks like that if we don't have those conflicts, now this is not a problem, okay? Now, of course, you can say, well, but if you use cordyceps you are, and you are blocking all the transcription and everything and therefore, and then no, no, because we are able to reestablish replication. It's not that we are stopping the metabolism of the cells. Replication now go move faster, and the damage is not produced. Okay. Therefore, this is in favor of that. The, the we we notice then later on that there is R loops there, but I want to go little by little. Then the th the question is, cells need to actively prevent the formation of their loops it, because if they form at a high level, we get into the pathology of the genome instability. But what I put at the beginning, no. We can increase genome instability by conditions that increase the blocks in replication. And this is what we are trying to move on. Then there are two major type of proteins that we believe are acting on our loops. Uh, one is preventing the formation of the loop during transcription. And for that, the RNA is forming this nuclear particle. And somehow the cells has to deal with the fact that this RNA is not able to go back and form their loop. But if they form, now we need it particular enzymes that will remove them, the one that are non rna H. Okay. The H comes from the hybrid. It eliminates this one. But rna dna helicases are coming now as a major uh, player in this. The first one uh, was senataxin in human cells, same one in these cells. But now I will be talking about some of them, and I will bring you into the discussion about this problem. Then during transcription, as I mentioned, there are a number of proteins that are binding to the RNA. Many of them are working at, at this uh, interface between transcription and RNA export, and when you remove them, you have both a transcription elongation problem and a RNA export problem. And a number of them, not all of them, when you remove them, you have a genome instability, like the HPR1 that Limwich said, we later on realize uh, being part of this, and this is part of the THO complex. That is the one we use uh, uh, majorly now for our studies. But some other proteins, when you remove them, you are affecting the same thing. And then our original idea, and this is with the work now of many laboratories, is that these proteins are helping the RNA to form this mRNP particle to get exported. But collaterally, they are preventing this RNA to go back to the DNA. Okay? And then, indeed, what we have been doing recently is to purify okay, the whole structure by using cap binding proteins, the CBP80 or CBP20, so that we uh, pull down the RNA from the cap binding and we do the proteomic analysis of all the proteins that are bound there. And we compare the data of the, of the normal cells, the wild type, with those in which uh, uh, we have removed the one of the components of the thought complex. And you can see that many proteins are there, but now, many of them are coming down. You see THOT2, MFT1, HPR1, THP2, those are four components of the THOT complex, TEX1, and but others disappear from the mRNP particle. And on the other side, others are more abundant. Then we are really changing the structure of the mRNP particle. In terms of the proteomic, we haven't gone that far, but that means it is true that when we are removing this protein, the structure of the mRNP particle changes in a way that now facilitates the formation of their loop. And we know that these proteins are working all over the genome, because if we do chip sec, this is done in G cells, and in this case we use a, 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 a digron, okay? It's a conditional mutant that we construct, uh, and then we just have the normal cells, and now we just inactivate the protein, and we check what is going on just half an hour later, so that we don't have 
uh, space to accumulate suppressors or anything like that. And then you can see how when we analyze the presence of DNA RNA hybrids compared to the wild type, we can see that there are regions that are extremely enriching hybrids, okay? Uh, when we do the metagenomic analysis, you can see that. Genes in which there is no hybrids, and now we can see hybrids in the mutants depleted of this complex, or genes in which you already see a low level of hybrids, and when you remove the complex, it goes even higher. And we know that this is associated with the general problem I bring to you. This is now analyzing, I, and here I show you another protein, but it's the same with the HPR1, but just another protein involved in the, in the MRMP particle. And then you can see uh, uh, up here the wild type, the presence of the RRM3. What is RRM3? RRM3 is a helicase that uh, uh, goes together with the replication machinery. Therefore, when we do a chip, sec or chip chip with RRM3, we are basically making picture of where the replication for is. You can see this is in the wild type, and that's the, you can see there is always accumulation in genes that are transcribed. And now you can see here that when we remove this protein, now we can see the accumulation in regions that that, is not, that was not before, but you can see that they are much higher accumulation. Therefore, it's telling you that when you remove this protein, that is leading to the accumulation of hybrids. Now you are starting to start finding also in this region, where in a specific one we can see that there are hybrids, we can see that there is a problem in replication. The folks are not able to move on uh, quickly. Then, now I think I move now to human cells. And now what is what we have now? That we, we try to figure out what is this protein really doing, because we know nothing. We know that it binds to RNA, we know that it's recruited into the RNA polymerase early during transcription and via the CTD, but we don't have an activity. And then we try to figure out, okay, let's go and let's try to see partners of this complex that can give us an idea of what is really happening. And then we do a, with human cells, I mean, we, sorry, with the human genome, we did a two-hybrid analysis to see whether we could see proteins that could interact with this so complex. In this case, we have to do that for the following. We already did a lot of proteomics. And when you do proteomics with proteins that bind RNA and work in RNA processing, what you get mainly is are all the RNA processing proteins. And therefore, we are in the same point. We cannot advance. Then by doing the two hybrid, we expected to, fat, to find transient interaction. And this is what we found with syn 3 a We suddenly discovered that so interact is able to talk with syn 3 a And what is syn 3 a It's the histone diacetylase. This is good. We have an RNA binding protein that is working RNA on the RNA during transcription. It's able to talk with a chromatin remodeler. And then what is that the acetylase doing? It comes from an open chromatin that is hyperacetylated to a state of hypoacetylation. It's compacting chromatin. Then we might think, it's what we have in hand, but it's difficult to show that during transcription, this protein has a different role. Thor is important in RNA export transcription, but collaterally is preventing by allowing a, 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 a normal mRNP particle, preventing the formation of the hybrid. But in order to ensure that, we believe that it's able to talk to the SYN3A complex that is conserved from yeast to human cells to act in a way that now will transiently deacetylate histone to close chromatin so that you are preventing the formation of the hybrids. You can see this here, no? This is the analysis, sorry. Uh, this is the analysis of the acetylation of histones when we deplete some of the components of the syn3a complex. In here we study histone H4. You can see the levels of increase. And we can see the increase in the DNA RNA hybrid. We are reproducing the same phenotype as when we remove the THO complex, okay? And therefore, it goes in favor. I will show you just this data because this is public. We study the damage and all that, but I will not go through. But then what we do is, let's say we did this is general. Then we use a, a general inhibitor of diacetylases. And then we use in here two different uh, amounts of TSA, 100 nanomolar, 250 nanomolar. And when we do immunofluorescence with the uh, DNA RNA hybrid antibody, we can see an increase that is in, uh, going up as we are increasing the amount of TSA. Then certainly, if we are opening chromatin, we facilitate the formation of the hybrids. And the idea that the thought complex is able to this uh, complex, I think, may make sense. But now, uh, re I remember 
remember that we are talking now about this lever, the chromatin, the RNA covered by proteins, and this is preventing the formation of the hybrid. But uh, this may happen accidentally, and then you need an additional ways now to remove that. And then here we focus on one DNA RNA helicase, that UEP56, but we knew that this protein interact with the thought complex. Uh, the Ed Herb, uh, lab say that it forms a larger complex traits. I think that complex is formed really on the DNA. UEP56 is very abundant protein, and it's an RNA dependent ATPase, okay? It's the close to a, an RNA helicase. It's an RNA chaperon. And then we try to see whether this helicase has anything to do with all this process. And then the classical thing is, okay, first, if it is working together with the thought complex, it does interact with the syn 3 ad acetylase, and this is the case. We do co-IP, and you can see that they are together. And this is, I, I guess you can see here, this is proximity ligation assay. Uh, this is a, a cell uh, biology assay in which you use the two antibodies, and then you have a, an oligo that allows you to do PCR, and then you have the fluorocom. Then the two proteins are very close by, then you see the signal. You see that only when we put both together, you can see the red dots. That means that the two proteins are able to talk, importantly, inside the nuclei, okay? Therefore, these two proteins talk together, okay? That is expected. The second is, do we accumulate hybrid? This is the immunofluorescence. In this case, we didn't remove the hybrids from the cytoplasm that most of them are mitochondria. There is a lot of hybrid forming the mitochondria because they replicate like that. But if you calculate what is the intensity inside the nuclei, you see an increase. And if we do immunoprecipitation in different genes, um, you can see that there is a relevant and significant increase. And importantly, we are able to remove the signal if we overexpress RNAsH. This is important, okay? Therefore, we are really seeing when you remove this protein that there is an increase in hybrids. And again, this hybrid leads to damage because if we see damage by one typical marker of double strand brace that is gamma is two eggs, okay? Or by comet assay, you can see that there is an increase in damage in both cases, no matter how we measure that. And importantly, this damage is suppressed by overexpressing RNAsH. You can see that in here. Therefore, we have again into this phenomena. We are creating a condition affecting the metabolism of the RNA and transcription so that now there's form too many hybrids and the problem is that now we have a lot of damage, okay? And this damage is created by that. Then the question now is, we have an uh, RNA-dependent ATPase. The question is, do this protein has a DNA-RNA unwinding activity? Then we contacted Patrick Soon, that is a, a wonderful biochemist, and we provide them the, the, the system to purify the proteins, the wild-type protein, and two mutants. One is a, an ATPase mutant and ITP binding mutant. Then, as we knew, this protein was able to open RNA-RNA, as I mentioned to you, and this is the analysis, no? You can see that as we are uh, to uh, uh, amounts of this wild type, we go from the double-stranded RNA to single-stranded RNA, unwinding activity. And this is not being able to be performed by the mutant forms, okay? These two mutants, when we have them here, they do not work, okay? And it's a specific RNA, RNA, and not of DNA, DNA, no effect there. What happened if we use now DNA-RNA hybrid? You can see that it's able to open DNA-RNA in vitro, okay? But not the mutant forms, okay? And when we compare double-stranded RNA with single stand, uh, with, uh, with the hybrid, you can see that with very small amounts, uh, we don't see the ability, this is, of course, in vitro, to open the RNA-RNA, but you can see that you need much less amount. I mean. Looks like that in vitro is much more efficient opening DNA and RNA. Even though I'm not saying that this is not an RNA chaperon, the role of this protein is to work on the RNA, helping together with the thought complex to form the mRNP particle. But it has a second ability, that is to remove that. But now we get into this problem. This is what I want to discuss. No? If you go now to the literature, many people is getting into RNA dependent ATPases and doing in vitro assays. And now this is a list of proteins where the people, when they get this protein, they purify the protein, and they get into the analysis in vitro, they see that they are able to unwind DNA RNA. And this is an issue. Then, what is what this mean? My feeling, and I remarked that feeling, feeling, this I, I know, 
is that, you know, the RNA helicase, if you, some of you are, I mean, many of you are a structuralist. Probably I'm, I'm heretical when I say this thing, but okay, I will say that. When you have a protein that is able to open RNA, that is making a, a, a duplex with RNA, it recognizes the RNA that is being opened, the main part, I would say. But if you have in, in the lower part a DNA strand, they, it will be still able to go into the RNA and open the RNA. They do, doesn't care whether you have a DNA. In vitro, probably you are able to get that. Then my feeling is that anyone that get an RNA helicase and go in vitro, you will be able to use the conditions of amount of protein or cofactors in which you will always be able to open or unwind DNA RNA. The question is, is this really the function in vivo? And this is the major issue. Um, why is a major issue? Because in some of these proteins, when you remove them, you get accumulation of DNA RNA hybrid all over the place. And this makes you think, ha, huh, this is too much redundancy. Why do cells need so many DNA RNA unwinding activity? When, when you remove just one, you get the same phenotype as when you remove the other. Therefore, looks like they are doing the same. It doesn't make sense. The thing to me is very important to show that in vivo at least you have some clues that your protein is able at least to remove hybrids or to prevent the formation of hybrid. And therefore, what we did is to overexpress the protein, that this is not a thing that is being done. We overexpress the protein in different conditions, not only to complement the, pro the, the cells that do not have the original UAP56, but other helicases like DDX23, Senataxin, Aquarius, that has not been shown to be a DNA unwinding, but suspect that could be the THOC1, that is not a RNA DNA helicase, or FANG-D2. FANG-D2 is Fanconi. And Fanconi has nothing to do with RNA metabolism in principle. It's more related to repair, linked to replication problems. But in all these situations, we know that hybrids are accumulated. And you can see that in all cases. Hybrids up, hybrids up, hybrids up, hybrids up significantly. We overexpress UAP56, and in all cases, we see that it's down. Therefore, UAP56 in vivo is able to remove all type of fabric, no matter, no matter how you create the conditions to accumulate them, no matter whether you are acting on Fanconi, whether you are acting on other RNA helicases, or whether you are acting on the thought complex or some depth. I think this is for us, and the damage is the same. You can see that in all this depletion, there is an increase in damage measured by gamma is 2 x and when we overexpress, UAP56, we can see that there is a reduction. We have used also the mutant forms of UAP56, and they do nothing. That means, as you expect. I think this put us into the idea that this is a general factor. Then, of course, UAP56 is working all over the genome. This is the chipset of this protein in the genes. You can see the accumulation of hybrids in normal cells, and you can see that it's higher when we deplete UAP56. This is, this is DRIPSEC, immuno. Uh, immuno uh, precipitation of the of the hybrids we using the antibody, and if we do the metagenomic analysis, you can see that indeed in cells depleted of UAP56 there are higher uh, levels of hybrids, and, and when we go to a gene, uh, I mean it's a meta meta analysis, you can see that all over the the gene um, being increased toward the three prime end, there is a larger amount of hybrids being accumulated. Therefore, we get into this picture. Certainly, transcription, the role of transcription is to produce an RNA. But transcription has a, a danger. And the danger is that RNA is reactive. And therefore, I think evolution collaterally developed new function for these proteins that his main function, their main function is another one. The thought complex is working on the RNA. I put just the three that I've been working with, but certainly there are others. And this talk to UAP56, because if accidentally a hybrid is formed, UAP56 is there, not only assembly the MRMP acting as a chaperone, but it's able now to remove co-transcriptionally the hybrid. And the SYN3A, that would be a way to close chromatin. Now let's think about thin, because in the field, if you ask somebody, what is the major function removing hybrids? Then you would think, RNA-SH. Then I sometimes get, what for cells do you need? But you have RNA sage. And this is wrong. And I, why is wrong? These people might think in a different way. But when you move to human cells, you have 100 KB genes, 600 KB genes, no? Then imagine that during transcription accidentally, 
one short region form a DNA RNA hybrid. You have to remove it. What happens if you remove it with a ribonuclease H? That you cleave the RNA. Cells doesn't want to do that. It doesn't make sense. RNAs H are more involved in Tuokasaki, in other type of hybrid, but co-transcriptionally, for a long gene, it makes much more sense that you have an RNA DNA unwinding activity that release the RNA and you can continue. Okay? I think that that is important, but certainly this is if you want philosophy. But I guess that it makes sense. Okay, then let's go to the final part. That is uh, still the RNA may stay there because as you know in nature, not everything is black and white. Part of this will be leaky and some of these hybrids will remain there. And this is where the what Lumi mentioned about Fanconi, BRCA2, and all that. Then if the RNA is still forming the hybrid at the time that replication for is coming, then we have a problem. Because now we'll, you will stack the fork. And you have to solve this. And the way we think after finding the BRCA2, the fact complex that I mentioned, the Fanconi pathway, and now there are others, that they accumulate hybrids is because this is interpreted as a block that could be a, an intertranscross link also. Avalu, this is an interesting question also because when people use mitomycin C, we always think in intertranscross link between two DNA strands. But if you have a hybrid, the intertranscross link may happen between the RNA and DNA. Therefore, the question is, the third has to deal with this. And as, you have, as long as you have Fanconi, you will be able to pass through. And then indirectly, the hybrid will be removed. Therefore, it's not that these functions are necessarily acting directly on DNA RNA hybrid. It's acting on the four that has to solve the problem. And in order to solve the problem, you have to bypass the hybrid, okay? If you don't have them working, BRCA might be involved because you may break this, okay? But if you don't have them, the four gets stuck there, and therefore you don't remove the hybrid. And this is why you would see the accumulation. Therefore, the concept is different, okay? Now, you can see then, if in cells depleted of UAP56, I want to focus on, on this, that this is the, because this is unpublished and I wanted to bring, then what happened in replication? Because then when we analyze combing, this is the normal cells, 1.6 kb per minute, it comes down to 1.34 kb per minute. The speed is slightly reduced, but significantly reduced. And when you treat with RNA sage, this is a wild way of removing the hybrids, now the speed is the same. But the main thing is not the speed when you want to talk about stalling of the replication for, is the asymmetry. Why the asymmetry? You know, the way that the combi measure is you start in, um, in the region that is where the origin of replication was, and then you see the two arms of the force coming away. Then if there is a reduction in the speed, usually the, the two strands that you see as being replicated should have similar size, right? But if there is a block in one of the sides, it's very unlikely that the block on the other side is going to be exactly at the same position. And this is what we measure asymmetry. That is, how long is one side versus the other? Then the highest is the asymmetry. It's telling you that there is a problem with the stalling of the replication for. And you can see this in here. This is the asymmetry. It's an arbitrary unit, 17.7. When you remove UAP56, it goes really high. That, that is a high asymmetry is telling you there is something happening because one side of the four is much uh, longer than the other. And when you overexpress RNA sage, this disappears. Okay? Therefore, it's telling you that it's, it is real. I mean, you are increasing a, a artificial in this case because you are using a condition that increase the hybrid. You are really having a problem with, with that. And not only that, I think, yeah. Not only that, but you can see here that we can see that in those sites where we have the conflict, transcription replication, you expect Fanconi to come there to resolve the problem. And you can see that nicely here. This is FANG-D2, okay? Once you replete, deplete UAP56. RNA-SH is marked with a GFP. And you can see that when we have the cells transfected and overexpressing RNA-SH, now we, con we cannot see FANG-D2 foci. Therefore, and you can see the, the analysis here, no? When you remove, uh, uh, when you remove this protein, 
we see an increase in fundi to foci that is depleted. I mean, these foci are suppressed when we are overexpressing RNA age. Okay, and then we have this triangle there. Therefore, we have this theme. This is the way to prevent the formation of their loops. In here, I would put now UEP56, okay, that this is yet unpublished. And in addition, we have Fanconi. We have other proteins that I don't have the time to work because now we are very much into chromatin. We have now chromatin remodelers that are working at this level to allow the progression of the replication for, and again, we have similar thing as with Fanconi. And therefore, we have two things. Preventing the formation of their loop of the DNA RNA hybrid, function that remove the hybrids, and then if st still they remain there, the replication for and the DNA repair associated proteins are working to remove them. Okay, then we have this general map. Transcription and R loops create replication stress. Naturally, we can induce that even more. And that will lead to the DNA damage and the DNA damage triggers the DNA damage response. Therefore, we ask ourselves, then what happens in normal cells when you re remove the DNA damage response? Because if the hybrids are being formed there, the way we think is that naturally some of them will pass off the problem, we get into replication and will create a problem and damage. And then what we did is a general screen for different factors, okay, that are from the DNA damage response gene. This is a library of about 400 uh, different genes. And genes you can find by measuring directly the increase in R loops that many of them increase R loops, okay? UV2B, raditin, um, you can have them here by, this is immunofluorescence drip, you can have single strand uh, break repair, double strand break repair, post replicate repair. I have different aspects in here. You can see always there is an increase in the amount of R loops, and this is eliminated by overexpressing RNA age, just by affecting uh, DNA repair and DNA damage response genes. And you can see that in some of them. This is ATR, okay, that is a major uh, uh, kinase detecting single strand DNA breaks and damage during replication. You can see that there is an increase in our loops. This is significant. And if we inhibit transcription by using here either cordycepine or DRB, you can see that this increase in our loops is now uh, removed, okay? And the same in, in this case, that is a, a, a post replicative repair gene. Uh, I should now. Another thing, this is again the same, showing you with ATR, ATM, there is always R loops, you can see the signal, and when you overexpress RNA sage, the signal comes down, in here it's not that clear. The damage is the same, but look at in here. This is the replication for, you can see some of them. You can see that in ATR, you can see in this particular one that has been selected, I want to, in, instead of putting the general data I put this, you can see that this is shorter, because you are affecting the progression of the four. ATM, not that much because probably you know that ATM is double-strand break. And post-replicative repair, the same. They are pretty long. If we use an inhibitor of ATR, this is untreated cell, and this is using the inhibitor. You can see the accumulation of our loops. Then though, what is this telling us? This telling us that, indeed, the RNA-DNA hybrid is sporadically formed in the cell. But the cell has many ways to deal with that. One is preventing, the other one is removing, but now, when you get into replication, the DNA damage response has a number of functions that are going to deal with the final one. And if you don't have the DNA damage response working properly, then those R loops will remain there because you are not, it's not that you are not able to remove directly the R loops. It's because the replication and the DNA repair is not doing the job, and therefore the whole structure gets frozen. Okay? And therefore, we get into this. That is the way we look at this. The way to check our loop is now different. It's not just, you know, everything I have focused is like this. The R loop being formed during transcription without touching the DNA. But I show you now the post-replicative repair, and certainly there are R loops that are not formed necessarily in G1. They are formed later on. And why is this important? Because as you can imagine, during replication, the lagging strand, it will be for a while single-stranded. And then you have an option to form easily DNA RNA hybrids there. And now we have functions that accumulate R loops only in S phase and not in G1. And functions that accumulate in G1 and S phase. Therefore, the field is going to be expanded because we need to distinguish between R loops formed at different 
stage of the cell cycle. And this is why probably post-replicatory repair would be important there. But another issue that is important is what happened in breaks. No? This is growing up. And then you have to think now the following, because this was already shown by, by several labs. I, I put some of the people there. They, when you have a, this situation, there is a topological constraint there. Because in order to form the, the DNA RNA hybrid, you need to open the DNA. Why, this is why when you remove top of one, you accumulate negative supercoil and you increase the probability of forming the R loop. But what happens if you make a nick? This was done first by Mike Lieber in the S region in bacteria, uh, using bacteria in small. And then when you, re when you make a nick, you release that topological constraint because now the DNA can, can uh, rotate. And when you do the double strand breaks, it's the same. And then now there is a big debate because some people say, when you make a double strand breaks, now the RNA polymerase gets there and start transcribing. I think that has not been shown. We have to think that during transcription, if a break occurs behind, now it releases the topology so that now the RNA that is hanging there is at a higher chance of being intertwined with the DNA and forming the DNA RNA hybrid. And therefore, the DNA RNA hybrid that can be seen in, 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 in double strand breaks it's a problem, and therefore you need to remove them to allow repair, because you need, if it is recombination, DNA resection, if it is not recombination, non-homologous in joining, and therefore this is a problem. And therefore, some heli cases, and Gael Elegube showed that with senataxin, are going to work also there. But this is the way I, I look at that, but I may be wrong, this is just a way to enhance the probability of forming a loop because you are releasing the constraint that was impeding their loop. But the function that may be working there, some of them may be general, and some of them may be specific of breaks. Therefore, this is an open field at this moment. And this is the last slide. If you go now to, to the literature, you will see all these many proteins that different laboratories has been showing that when you remove them, increase our loop. I showed you the DDR. Then I'm not surprised that if any of you, in, with your favorite project, when you create a stress situation, if you look for our loop, you will see our loops increase. The same way that if you look for gamma is 2 eggs, you will see them increase because they are there. And therefore, you are just creating a situation that you do not remove them easily. The important thing is to deal with the real functions that are there with a main function that co-transcriptionally remove, prevent them, that later on remove them, or that during replication and repair are able to deal with those structures that are going to block the progression of the four. And with this, I finished. I just want to acknowledge this is uh, my lab. Uh, there are a few more people now. This is the people I have been showing data, OK? Mm, some of them are postdocs. Some of them are PhD students, wonderful PhD students. Xu Xiaoyu did this work in Patrick Sun lab when they were in Yale. Now they are in Texas, as you probably know. Benoit Palanquet helped us doing the proteomic analysis of the mRNP particle in GIS. And certainly I have to thank the genomic unit of Cabimer where we do all this uh, genome-wide analysis and we saw that provided some regions. Thank you very much for your attention and certainly I if you're still alive, I make questions. Thank you much, Andres, for your lecture. Before I'll, I'll give the audience chance to ask questions, I would like to uh, give you uh, as a award to your scientific excellence and also your perseverance in following the theme, which at the beginning not too many people believed as, as a real oh, yeah. biological problem. <laughs> now I have to say hot. that was very good for us yes. because we could work freely without competitors. Yes. Now there is competitors <laughs> everywhere. That, is, that was an advantage, I have to say. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you. I really appreciate it. You know, I am... As you know, I am geneticist. I mean, I, my position, even though I'm in Cabimer, is in the university. I'm in the Department of Genetics. So I teach genetics. Therefore, coming to the place of Mendel to give a talk, to me, really came to my heart. And thank you very much. I really appreciate it. 
so now we have time for questions. Sorry, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Great sure. talk. So uh, I've got well, a million of questions, but two <laughs> I would yeah. like to ask now. Um, first, um, have you ever considered whether the DNA-RNA hybrids, the R loops, mm -hmm. if you look at them from the point of view of homologous recombination, they might resemble D loops. Do you think they might be used as an intermediate of a double-strand break repair and might be one of the sources of which you look at the yeah. induction of double-strand break repair? Uh, but you would bring, you would complicate the story because they, you have to bring RNA making a D-loop that uh, at the end will not help the, I mean, that is, is an intermediate that has been recognized and that has been shown by Carlene Simprich that some of the uh, nucleotide ethysium repair nucleases, like XPG and all that, they also recognize the flap structure and they are able to cleave there. And then some of the damage that is being produced when I put there in, in G1 with the nucleases might be those ones. But making a D-loop as an intermediate uh, of double strand break is, to me, is more complicated to see because I don't see how that will help because you have to bring an RNA and that D-loop itself, I don't know. Mm, I don't no, know. I, no, no, we have um, to... I might uh, misled you a bit. What I meant was whether the cell actively uh, discriminates between an R-loop and a D-loop because if you look at them from like structure... Yeah, the structure is the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So whether that might non, not cause an additional level of problem, not that they will be like using it as an intermediate per se. Yeah, yeah. Well, it may be. That, I mean, the case of BRCA, the, when we get the accumulation of BRCA, we don't know exactly. It may be related to that. But certainly having an RNA, I guess the cells will distinguish that. I mean, certainly, I mean, there are data even from Steve K from long ago where they, should, they could see that the REC-A was able to do RNA, uh, an R loop with RNA. Therefore, in vitro, you have those things. They, I mean, certainly there are data that might make you think in that possibility, but I don't know how that will help, but certainly, yeah, it's an interesting point. I mean, the other question was concerning the helica the RNA DNA, yeah. DNA hybrids and the winding, helicase. Yeah. So um, a counter argument to, to, to what you said is it would be the fact that the RNA DNA hybrids are more stable yeah, than absolutely. the DNA DNA hybrids yeah. and RNA RNA hybrids even more. Uh -huh, uh -huh, right. So having factors that are more active on RNA DNA hybrids will mean that they are like they, they require more energy in order to separate those two strands. Yeah. So well, they the active, they why this? Active, but yeah. Why they? But 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 I think the fact that in, in this particular case in vitro is more efficient. I think looks to me that is really an RNA DNA unwinding activity. When you have the opposite, then you don't know. But certainly, I, I agree that that is a big point. But I don't know. I, I guess that you guys, as structuralists, try to relate structure with function, might have the answer for that. I, I don't know. But yeah, yeah, that is a, a point. Certainly, DNA and RNA are expected to be more stable. So if, I, if I remember correctly, several years ago, there were papers claiming there are small RNAs coming yeah, from the side. Yeah, Fabrizio's story. Yeah, and there are several systems actually, and they even leave epigenetic marks on the. Right. Could you comment on that? Yeah, okay. It's a different story, even though Fabrizio is ending now in long RNAs. Uh, the story there is that you have a. Um, a it is true that when you have ended, free ended uh, DNA, you can have RNA polymerase getting there. In that case, it's the synthesis of short RNAs. And those short RNAs form double standard RNA that triggers Drosha, Dicer, and blah, blah, blah. And because it's, they, they propose that as a way to trigger DNA damage response. It's not exactly the DNA RNA hybrid. Even though now they are evolving into DNA RNA hybrid, I think that is a very complex uh, thing because now I think I was talking with some of you about this, the formation of PIC in the, PIC is the promoter initiation complex. Uh, this is very complex structure because to me the DNA damage response has to be, it's a stress response. It has to be a quick, fast response. Therefore, to me it's hard to believe that now you uh, create like suddenly a promoter to start just the triggering of that. Then I, I don't know. The relation with chromatin, this is an issue. I didn't, I didn't get into this. We are, we are also working into that. Uh, uh, the way we think that the DNA RNA hybrid is blocking uh, the replication is more complex than this. Uh, we published this already, but uh, we have mutant in Gs uh, uh, that are from histones, histone mutants that increase 
dramatically the levels of hybrids to the same level as when you remove thaw, but they show no instability at all. Then you have high levels of hybrids, no instability. Then we found some time ago using C. elegans, human cells, um, and yeast, that the hybrids, when we had instability, were associated with the mark of condensation that is setting temp phosphorylation of histone H3. And then what happened to this mutant of yeast is that they form hybrids, but they are not able to phosphorylate the setting temp. Then I think that the hybrid may trigger a further step of chromatin compaction that is what is really blocking. Uh, but those mutants are really intriguing. And Nick Proudfoot has in the termination region also a relationship in this case with uh, histone 3K9 demethylation, that is a heterochromatin mark. Therefore, the connection between hybrids and um, heterochromatin and compaction is there, but we need to understand it further. And in some cases, the antisense RNA that is producing promoter is associated with hybrids and silencing. This is why, therefore, this is something that we need to explore further, but it's very intriguing. This is why we are getting more and more into chromatin. I always think about, I mean, you know, cheese, no? That is a way of, 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 of silencing the whole chromosome X. How, I mean, this is because bring a lot of, 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 of remodeler of, of chromatin, but how this happened to me is very intriguing, but now every time I see RNA, then who knows, perhaps one intermediate is a DNA or any hybrid. I think that is open, but it's certainly a very important point, yeah? So I'll also, Andres, ask you, I mean, from the, the massive response that the R loops cause to the replication, to me it's hard to believe that it's only like a coincidence of leftover R loops that, and if you look at the bacteria or mitochondria where they clearly play the role in initiation and replication. So yeah. there must be probably balance between the positive and negative oh, role yeah, yeah. of the R loops. Absolutely. So could you maybe speculate more on the positive role of the R loops? What, what would be the advantage? Yeah. The way I see the positive, because this has not been explored, is that it's a, a structure that has been catalyzed by something. I think Christoph Neer has now this GADD45 that makes our loops mm -hmm. in, in promoters. Then it's mediated by a protein. A protein goes there to make, it's different to the mitochondria and the class switching, because this is a region where you form a longer loop and this is control, and only there. But my feeling is that those with a positive role are mediated by proteins. It's not something occurring randomly, mm -hmm. okay? A protein that makes it there or a protein that stabilizes it there or something like that. The ones that I'm talking are unscheduled loops that accidentally occur like damage. And those are the ones that the cells are not ready for that. Mm -hmm. In the case the, 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 the R loop uh, or the DNA RNA hybrid got a function uh, I think that is something else. Uh, it's difficult, of course, to understand the concept of transcription termination because, I mean, Nick Proufus uh, has, uh, with, with David Livingstone, all this, and BRCA1 being there. There are many things going on there, but I think I would like to know first, okay, what is the length of that DNA RNA hybrid when we are, how, how this will help, because they, the way they think this will help to block, to pose the RNA polymerase, and because that then you start building up the whole termination thing. Therefore, it's again a complex structure and that is regulated. And I think that is an important thing. The, the positive R loop is not just an R loop that goes randomly. I think the cells develop a machinery, like in CRISPR. CRISPR, you come with an RNA and forms. If you think, I mean, tel telomerase, I mean, it's different, but you have an RNA and you use it as a template to, to form DNA. Let's talk about DNA and RNA hybrid, no? It's always a protein there that makes a, a job. And maybe uh, one more question. So as you mentioned, the topological stress, right, yeah. associated with, with need to removal uh, and the role of RNAsH. I mean, there is a lot of ribonucleotides being incorporated in the DNA. Yeah. So isn't Absolutely. the RNAsH role, rather than, you know, cleaving the, the messenger, yeah. it's making the NICs to, uh, on the top of the top of one, right. remove right. the topological stress. Right. This is the case of RNAsH2. RNAsH2 is able to remove hybrid, but it's, it's the function is the, what the RNA uh, esthesium repair, no? That mm -hmm. cleaves the ribonucleotides in order to start the process top of one depending on all that. Absolutely. That, how that affects a loop, this is, actually this is something that 
we have been trying to, to do, no? That is, if you have, because you know that there are, uh, in this cell, you can do that. We try to do that with the mutants of, of, of this guy in, in, in the States, in NIH. Uh, the guy that, that have this mutant of the polymerase that are able to distinguish yeah. uh, the, the lagging from the leading strand. And you have a particular mutant that introduced a lot of ribonucleotides. Then by doing that, then you should be able to have a, a, a mutant that if you cleave there, you will increase their loops. Mm -hmm. But we haven't got into the, the, ana the analysis yet. But certainly that is a, a good point. Therefore, that is a good example on how our loops might be enriched by many different manners. Yeah. So when you have these collisions between replication and transcriptions, you, you get mutations as a result. So do you have a, a rough guess how often you can actually uh, get a recombination between the two forks, between the replication? I think the way we think is that, that the end you will break the fork because uh, I think that is critical. I mean, we have been doing experiment doing RNA polymerase against RNA polymerase and the type of damage you get is much lower. Even playing with the topo, uh, because I, I was t talking with somebody also about topology, no? I don't like, before we used to talk, uh, use the word collision, and when people think about collision, think in the physical interaction, this may not happen. It may be just conflict, because you have this positive supercoil in between, because as the two are moving. Then I think the, the, the breaks are because the replication fork breaks. I think that is the major case. I don't think there's actually a difference between any block of the replication and when it's blocked by the transcription or the RE. Being there like an open, open DNA next to the replication for which it can invade or... No, I don't think so, because if it is coming from behind, you, that is when you find the open DNA, probably the problem is much lower, because the heli case of the, of the replication for probably is able to remove the RNA, and therefore that is not a problem. The problem is when you hit, when, when you uh, find the, the, the transcription machinery coming from in front, because the RNA polymerase, it will be in front, and therefore that is what it might be blocking. The, the hybrid, what it's doing is to stabilize the RNA polymerase there for longer. That is the way I think. But this is why probably what we were talking about, the, the chromatin compaction associated with the hybrid might also play a role. I, I think we don't know. But at the end, at the end, the way we think is that you affect the, the fork. And this is why Fanconi and all these protein have the, the, the increase in the level of our loops. Okay, any more questions? Sorry, I, I just had a question going more into the uh, electro, um, so, sorry, into the stability uh, issue. So, if the antibody that you were presenting, people were using for chip, right? Uh, but we do, no, we don't do chip. We, don't chrom we, know Im we do not immunoprecipitate chromatin. We immunoprecipitate DNA directly. Okay, because I saw that perhaps you, someone might try to do a chromatin IP with the antibody. Yeah, that, that was in the old times. But the way to do that is, is directly DNA. We isolate DNA in a condition that we keep the hybrids, and then we purify directly there. Because and then we sequence the RNA. This is why we have the uh, uh, strand-specific signal. OK, yeah. I see. So you, you, okay, so you did a chip seek with the antibody now, if I'm... We do drip. We call it drip because okay. DNA, RNA, immunoprecipitation. So in chip means chromatin, and we do not get the chromatin. But then you have, in principle, all the information you said, like about the lengths of or the regions that would uh, form a hybrid, theoretically, yeah, which genes, and eventually even about the GC content, no? Yeah, but with the drip, with the immunoprecipitation, you cannot know the length of the hybrid. You know the extension of the region that form hybrid, but you don't have single molecules. You may have, may have hybrids that are 20 base pairs long, but covering a region of 2 kb. 20, 20, because it's very often. In order to get the length, you need to get single molecules and uh, then I, analyze. I, I, and no, this I, is why bisulfide. I, I do agree, but uh, I was like thinking there should be a correlation. I mean there is a correlation. And indeed, okay, I can say because uh, Fred Chedan, that is probably uh, from my viewpoint, the, the guy that do better this study, 
He presented recently uh, in, in a meeting that we had in France uh, data trying to compare the DRIP analysis with the bisulfide analysis in a number of genes. You know, the, the correlation was amazingly identical. I was, we were really shocked. Then okay. certainly there is a correlation, but these are not the data that are published yet. And I'm really eager to, to see those data, but it, the, he, he could superimpose one profile with the other. So, so my question is more speculative, and perhaps you have an idea. So if you would have two genes consecutively oriented in the same direction, and you form a, let's say, an R loop, then you should actually block the transcription of the other one, and you should, if you have a potential to form an R loop, yeah. if you would do this drip, you should see a smaller region protected. Okay. I mean, I was like wondering whether you see this When you have two genes separated, then one polymerase will not go into the second one. But what is happening in the way you think, because they are loop I, also... I was thinking when they are moving in the same direction. Right, but then it's the same gene. And this is the way it is interpreted that an R loop affects transcription. It's not, I mean, it could act also on the RNA polymerase that produce the R loop. But the problem is that the RNA polymerase that are coming behind. Because the RNA polymerase that are coming behind, then they will hit their loop and they will block there. And this is originally, uh, this has been always the model to explain why RNA polymerase do not progress through our loops. It's because it's an accumulation of RNA polymerases coming one behind the other. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, any more questions? If not, then please join me thanking uh, for a wonderful talk, and I'll see you next week for Caroline Dean. Thank you, Andreas. Thank you very much. Thank you.